Jeremiah 8, verse number 14. Jeremiah preaching, he's been preaching through several chapters to them to repent, to turn, to see the error of their ways. And in verse 14 he says, Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter into the defense cities and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they are come. And have devoured the land, and all that is in it, the city, and those that dwell therein. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices, among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven in, in, images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people and my hurt, I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for allowing us the privilege to be able to come to the house of God tonight. Lord, we realize there are parts of our country that are still shut down where they don't have this privilege. Lord, we know uh, on the West Coast there are churches being fined thousands of dollars to assemble. And Lord, please help us not to take for granted this privilege Lord, help us to certainly do as you told us to do in Ephesians 6, to stand therefore. Lord, because if we don't make a stand, Lord, it won't be long. We won't be allowed to worship either. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, you'd hallow this place to your namesake tonight. You would take up your boat. You'd speak to our hearts. You'd send revival. God, you'd do great things. Lord, it is a blessing to see Brother Eddie sitting there tonight. Lord, he came in Sunday, lost, but Lord, he came in tonight, saved, ready for heaven. Lord, we're glad that you're in the saving business. And God, we're also glad you're in the reviving business. And so, Father, we pray you'd help your people. I know many of them have worked hard this week. Some have labored hard today. And God, I pray, Lord, as they have found themselves in the house of God, they will be refreshed. Lord, their minds would be crisp, and Lord, they'd be able to uh, contemplate what thus saith the Lord, and not only become hearers of the Word of God, but doers of the Word of God. Help us tonight as we sit in the midst of a perverse generation, in the midst of a wicked uh, uh, people, in a day and age where our country doesn't resemble what she once did. I pray in your wrath you'd remember mercy. And God, I pray that we'd see many come to Christ in these days. Help us tonight, Lord, to be seated in heavenly places. Use this unworthy vessel and get glory to yourself. And we'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to several things as a way of introduction. I want you to notice, first of all, the charge by God's man. Look, if you will, again in verse number 14. He says, Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves. And let us enter into the defense cities, and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence, and given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord. Uh, notice the charge was for them to assemble themselves, uh, and then to become still and know that God is God. He reminds them uh, 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 what they are facing, uh, uh, the tumult that is on the horizon. They're about ready to be given over to another nation. Uh, if they don't repent and get right with God, judgment is coming. Uh, and he is saying we need to assemble ourselves. Uh, we need to contemplate on what thus 
Thus saith the Lord, uh, we need to uh, uh, quit uh, uh, walking around like we have the answers. and We need to look toward heaven. Uh, uh, God has given us a, a, a gall of water of bitterness to drink uh, that we might not be satisfied with where we are, but that we would once again uh, hunger and thirst for Him and His righteousness, uh, that we'd have the blessings of God once again in our nation. Uh, can I say there's a call today for churches to once again get back to being church? Amen. You would think that when God shut uh, uh, the doors of churches across this country for a season, that when they came back, folks would have been excited about the things of God. But isn't it amazing the more and more that the restrictions are loosed, the more and more lives are loosed. Loose living and not hungering and thirsting for the things of God. We see a charge. Notice the calamity in verse 15. Verse 15 says this, We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. Uh, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, uh, the city and those that dwell therein. Uh, uh, they're looking for peace and safety. Uh, uh, the false prophets had said, uh, Thus saith the Lord when God had not spoken. Uh, uh, the false prophets was giving them a, a peace and safety gospel, telling them just come as you are, everything's okay. Uh, isn't it amazing? Uh, uh, the Joel Osteens of our days uh, and the uh, uh, soft ear tickling preachers of our days uh, uh, says everything is good everything is fine uh, but listen to me uh, uh, my dear friends God gave us a space of grace a few years ago uh, and we have not fully taken advantage of it uh, and if God gives America what we deserve uh, what you're seeing in Seattle and Portland and Chicago a uh, uh, friend it'll be in every neighborhood uh, we've cried peace and safety so much We've not taken hold of what thus saith the Lord. In verse number 16, when he's referring to, we've heard the snorting of the horses in Dan. You see, Babylon's army had already started marching. They had already began uh, overthrowing cities. And they said they could hear uh, uh, the horses snorting. And it said uh, uh, the trembling, uh, 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 the sound of the thundering of the horses marching to them was causing even their very ground to shake. Uh, but it didn't shake them. Uh, friend, I don't know how much more handwriting on the wall people need to see. Now listen, we know that the God of this world has blinded the mind of lost people. They don't understand what's going on, but when are God's people going to wake up? Hmm? Hmm. I got to thinking about those horses there in verse 16, the snorting of his horses. And I got to thinking about in Revelation chapter 6, there's four horses mentioned. There's a red horse mentioned. Red horse is a picture of destructive power of war. Jesus said in a sign to the Jews in Matthew 24, uh, the sign of his literal second coming, there'd be wars and rumors of wars. You know, any given time in our day and age, there's over 100 wars going on across this globe right now. Now, we don't hear a lot about a lot of them, but there's civil wars going on everywhere. And can I say, he was talking to the Jews as a sign of his literal second coming. We as believers know the church is taken out of here seven years before his literal coming. We see the red horse of war. Can I say, there is the black horse mentioned in Revelation 6, and that, well, that pictures famine as a result of war. Can I say, in our country... We are at war in Afghanistan still. I did see where the president's bringing 2,000 more troops home. That's a blessing. But can I say, the wars abroad are bad enough, but the wars going on in America, we live in a divided country. We, there's a war between the press and the conservatives, and there's a war between liberals and conservatives. There's a war between uh, uh, some that think their lives matter more than others. I'm glad the Bible says God's no respecter of persons, aren't you? 
The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, and it took his blood because he tasted death for every man. His, his blood will save everyone. Amen. We find that we're in a war in our country. And because of that war, in Revelation 6, a famine came. And can I say, the Bible said in the last days there would be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Isn't it amazing? And they don't have a famine for sports. They love sports. They don't have a famine for entertainment. They don't have a famine for all kinds of folly. But even though in our day and age when there's more access to preaching than ever before, there's a greater famine for it. We have whole denominations built today on entertainment. You're naturally going to have a big singing. Folks will come out. You're naturally going to have a big supper. They'll come out. You're naturally going to have preaching. Well, look around. You, you got it. Hmm? The famine came as a result of war. And then there was the pale horse. The pale horse represents pestilence and disease. Now, we don't have to talk much about disease, do we? Hmm? COVID-19, there is a virus. There's always been a virus. There's always the swine flu, the bird flu, the crocodile flu, uh, the hoot nanny flu. There's all the time some kind of flu, some kind of virus. Can I help you with something? This one isn't any more deadly than what we had last year. It's just been politicized. Matter of fact, CDC just came out, only 6% of the deaths that have been associated with COVID actually died of just COVID, 6%. Hmm. Uh, by the way, since I'm on that, since Marcy voted for him, <laughs> you know our governor <laughs> came out. You didn't vote for him? Mary said you did. <laughs> uh, our governor came out last week and said in Lincoln County there were nine deaths associated with COVID. When they talked to the coroner of Lincoln County, he said there were zero deaths at all in the county. They talked to the only doctor's office in Lincoln County. You know what they said? We haven't seen anybody for COVID. So you can believe anything you want to that that guy said. I don't believe anything he says. Uh, uh, uh. You know, I, I, when I grew up, they used to say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Uh, they are. It's all politicized. Is there people who have gotten sick? Sure. Have people died? Sure. Should we have shut the whole country down? No. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. You know why we have these kind of things going on? Because the Antichrist is coming. It's all about fear. It's all about controlling people. And if you don't think they can't control people, just walk out and see how many people are wearing a mask. Hmm? Even the CDC will tell you a mask will not save you. It can't help you. All it's going to have you do is breathe your own bacteria. But they have so politicized how much that mask will save you and social distancing. Now, because the numbers are really uh, uh, being adjusted, and they're saying, see, we told you all this is what's brought the numbers down. I was born in a night, but I wasn't born last night. Mm. I've had too many surgeons and doctors and say, no, they can't. If those masks were so wonderful, how come the surgeons can't wear them in surgery? And if the masks are so wonderful, how come people can't go visit their loved ones in nursing homes? Or how come you can't go to the hospital and visit somebody that's got COVID? Just put a mask on. I mean, they're wonderful. They'll keep you from getting sick. Just put it on. Why? Why? Well, Huh? And isn't it amazing? They can loot and burn down a city without a mask and no problem. But you show up to the president's press conference without one and oh, wait! Even though all those people have been tested. Anyway, I, I, Marcy, why in the world did you get me on all that stuff? It's true whether you believe it or not. But then there's the white horse. That white horse represents a man-made peace that won't last. Amen. And 
I did hear today where the president was nominated for a Nobel Peace uh, Prize for uh, helping to issue a peace treaty between Israel and the Arabs. That's a blessing. Hadn't been one in a long time, but this one will have as much effect as the last one. Not going to be any peace in this world till the Prince of Peace comes and sits on the throne of David. Matter of fact, the Bible says when they shall cry peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon them. And we see the charge. We see a calamity. Notice the corruption in verse 17. I'm trying to hurry to get to the message, but you all got me preaching politics. Verse 17 says, For behold, I send serpents and cockatrices, that's scorpions, among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Mm, can I say this country has been stung by sin? Amen. Uh, when they legalized abortion back in 1972, they, they thought they were doing women a, a favor. What they did not realize is that 60 million aborted babies later, the price tag for sin is coming due. Uh, God's not marked. You, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, uh, be sure your sins will find you out. Uh, isn't it amazing? America leads uh, the world in producing you know, alcohol, and yet they think there'll be no consequence for that. America has now legalized drugs in many states and cities, and they think there'll be no consequences for that. You see, when those serpents get turned loose and corruption is revealed, there is a price. And there's so many people that see folks partying and having a good time, say, well, I'm going to get involved in that. I, you know, I'm Superman. It won't affect me. They never show the backside of the billboard or the backside of the advertisement. They show folks out having a good time, partying, sitting on a beach. They don't show you folks with cirrhosis of the liver. They don't show you folks with needle tracks going up and down their arms. Uh, they don't show you folks that used to be prominent uh, uh, figures in society and now they're living under a bridge. Uh, they don't show you broken homes. They don't show you children not knowing where their mamas or dads these are. Uh, they don't show you the re end result of sin. Amen. Can I say we live in a day and age where folks have been bit by a lot of things. Can I say it's filtering in our churches. And say, well, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. But you're still dealing with a little leaven and a little leaven. Leaven's a whole lump, my dear friend. A lot of folks... Uh, trying to hold on to as much of the world as they can and hold on to church and see, you know, how much they can get away with. Well, the problem is, is you're going to get stretched so thin, something's going to tear. And my dear friends, you can't, you can't uh, straddle the fence with God. You can't love the Lord and be the friend of the world. Amen. And then I want you to notice the cry of the Redeemer. God is speaking through Jeremiah, but listen to the heart of God and what he has to say. Look what he says in verse number 19. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended. We're not saved for the hurt of the daughter of my people and my hurt. I'm black. That, that terminology is there is someone that would dress for a funeral. He's in mourning over the condition of his people. He said, astonishment had taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? You know what the Lord is saying? He said, am I still not on the throne? Am I still not God? He's saying, is there still a balm of Gilead? Is there a great physician? He's saying, uh, why is my people not revived? Why is my people not uh, set on fire for me and serving me? 
Why are they given to strange vanities and other things? And God begins to lay forth questions. With God's help, I'm just going to preach. I've already preached longer than I'm going to preach, maybe. But I'm going to preach on this thought. I'm going to preach on why, why, why. And when Jordan was little, you're not going to believe this, he came out of the womb talking. And back then we drove 50 miles to church, and you can ask Miss Annette, all the way there, all the way home. Why? 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 Why, Mommy, is this this way? And why is this this way? Why is this? I can remember Miss Annette going, don't the kid ever shut up? I can say 27 years later, no. <laughs> but he always asked why. Could I say it's a good thing to ask why when you're inquisitive, when you want to know something. But here the Lord is asking why. And when God asks why and he's talking to his people, that's not a good thing. Amen. You see, my dear friends, we ought to be right behind him uh, walking in his footsteps, following him, following his direction, uh, following his word. Uh, our steps ought to go right through the pages of the word of God. Uh, uh, we ought to be listening to his voice. Uh, uh, we ought to be seeking to fulfill his will in our lives. Uh, uh, we ought to uh, 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 be a light to this uh, dark and destitute world. Uh, we ought to be taking the gospel to every creature. Uh, uh, we ought to do everything in our power to live a godly example in this day and age. And yet, many of God's children aren't. And God says, why, why, why? First of all, let me give you the first why. You find it verse 14. He says, why do we sit still? First of all, let me ask you, why are we idle? How many of you can see the handwriting on the wall? No, Jesus is coming soon. I mean, it's coming soon. 2 Timothy 3 says, This know also in the last days perilous times shall come. And he gives a whole list of things that shall come. Guess what? They're here. They've been here for a while. Uh, he also goes on to say, Paul does, uh, that they'd be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Uh, we live in the information age. Uh, and it seems like the more and more intelligent man claims he is, the more ignorant he is to the things of God. Uh, goes on to say they'd have a form of godliness but deny the fullness thereof a, a form is just an empty shell uh, and uh, a, a so called church after so called church after so called church uh, names the name of God but they're an empty shell they don't even resemble anything that uh, uh, begins to look holy and righteous and godly in this world and so why do we sit still we see all these things coming to pass why do we sit still? Why are we idle? Why are we not more than we are? Listen, if you knew for a fact that at 11 o'clock tonight, Jesus was coming, i got news for you. You wouldn't have just came in and plopped down in the pew tonight. You'd been on your face agonizing with God to give you boldness to call your loved ones, call your friends, go to your neighbors, and you'd be shouting from the housetop, get right, get right, get right. And unfortunately, just like a lot, many folks, they can yell that. And nobody's going to listen because they've watched your life for so long. Why are we idle? We should be stirred. Well, we've had four revival meetings this summer. We've been wonderful. We've had, I don't know, 12, 13 saved. Some since then. We've seen God bless and God move. Some of you are over the revival. Got another meeting coming up at the end of the month. And you're over it. You've, you're, you're not stirred. Got to be stirred. Hmm? Can I say this? We should be shining. They should see Jesus in us. They should hear his voice in our voice. That to know His will and how we conduct ourselves. And Paul said we're written epistles known and read of all men. When's the last time somebody came up to you and said, I don't know what you got, but I don't have it. Can you tell me what it is? Well, 
remember the kids when they was little sing that song, you know, this little light of mine, don't let Satan blow it out. Some of yours have been blown out. Hmm. We should be sounding the alarm. Jesus is coming. But I got new, good news. Jesus saves. He's coming. I was surprised I didn't get any flack when I had on the sign out there, mask won't save you, but Jesus will. I figured I'd get some flack from that, but I did. But it was true. He saves. He saves. And he's coming. He's soon coming. Can I help you something? Even lost people know something's going on in this world. This is more than just an election. So... The first why is, why are we idle? Yeah. Got a purpose in your heart from this night forward, I'm not going to be idle anymore. Amen. I'm going to do all I can to let folks know Jesus is coming. Can I say, secondly, not only why are we idle, why are we idolatrous? Look at verse 19. That's the second question God asked. He says, Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country is not the Lord in Zion, is not her king in her. Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? Why are we idolatrous? Now, I know you don't have an altar in your house with all kinds of little statues on it, and, you know, you don't have little cherubs, and you don't have little Buddhas, and you don't have little, at least I hope you don't. You don't have little things you bow down to and thank God for it, represent your ancestors and all these other kind of things. But you know anything that you put before God becomes your God? There are two things that he accuses them of. He accuses them of provoking him with graven images and provoking him with strange vanities. Too many believers have idols that they don't consider gods. Some people have idols that are portrayers, I'll call them. Actors, sports figures. Boy, you, you hang on everything that they, that they say. You'll skip church to wait in line to get one of their autographs. You know all their stats. You know all their quotes. But you don't quote Jesus. Hmm? Let me ask you something. Boy, it got real quiet on that, didn't it? Let me ask you something there, Donald Trump. <laughs> if you know more about the back of a baseball card of a baseball player than you know the books of the Bible, who's your God? You're welcome. I can boastfully say that after they've all acted the way they've acted, and I'm not against sports. I'm just against sports becoming your God. Yeah. But I haven't watched any of it. I haven't seen one Reds game, so I have not been disappointed this year. Huh? Y'all Cubs fans, at least you got something to cheer about lately, huh? <laughs> Lord have mercy. We got we we the way some of them have acted through all this stuff that's going on. I don't care if they ever show another one on TV again. But you see, and let me just say, since when, if you're pretty and you're on TV, makes you smart. They ask these people their opinions about stuff, and most of them, they didn't even graduate high school. They, they, they can't even tie their own shoes. That's why they got to hire people to do that for them. But they're going to tell us how to live? Huh? It's crazy. They are knuckleheads. And people say, oh, did you hear what so-and-so said? Who cares? Huh? I know y'all love George Clooney. He's from Kentucky. Do you know why You know why he moved out of Kentucky? Because they threw him out. He, he couldn't even graduate high school. He, he, he applied for all kinds of acting jobs before. Finally, he got one. He was about 40. 
Huh? But you all think he's wonderful. You know, he went to France because he's an idiot. Nobody wants to move to France. Huh? But you're going to listen to what he has to say? I'll just listen to what Jesus has to say. But you see, when we have these idols in our way, God is grieved and no revival comes. Oh, there's the idols of portrayers. Some people have politicians as idols. Listen, you don't have to be around me real long to figure out where it's where I'm going on this election. I mean, if you're for abortion, I'm against you. That's all you need to know right there. I don't even have to go anywhere else. And I certainly have appreciated the president we've had for the last few years because he's done more for churches in revoking the Johnson Act and uh, 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 certainly uh, uh, making certain bars stood for us during this COVID that the First Amendment still was part of the Constitution. Uh, but listen, i got news for you. I don't worship him. Some of you are more interested in what he says than what Jesus says. Hmm. I, 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 let me help you something. Heaven help us if he loses. But if he does, Jesus is still on the throne. It'll be all right. David said he'd not seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. God's always taking care of his people. Well, hey, yeah, even if we have to face persecution, it'll be all right. Heaven's just over the horizon, my dear friends. Some people worship politicians, though. Comes their God. Can I say this? Some people worship preachers. Well, I know down, I'm going down south next week to preach. Down in there, man, there's certain names you can't preach against. I found that out one time. I dropped a preacher's name that, I mean, he kissed the Pope's ring, so I'm against him. Huh? Uh, he's dead now. I hope he was saved. hope he's in heaven. But if he believed everything he wrote about James, I worry that he's even in heaven. But there are some people, they worship preachers. Hmm? That's why in, in, the, in the fundamental Baptist movement, if revival breaks out, the first thing they say, well, who'd you have preach? You know how many times I heard that during our meetings that broke out? Who'd you have preach? You know what I tell them? Holy Ghost. Amen. Yeah, we understand that, but, but who did the Holy Ghost use? Whoever he wanted. Yeah, well, that's why we had three or four preachers here every week. You know, it's just whoever. Hmm? It's not about man. It's about the Lord. There are some people who worship preachers. Hmm. That's the, the idol. What about, about them strange vanities? That's the graven image. What about them strange vanities? Why are we idolatrous? Too many are given the strange vanities of sports, of secular enticements. Man, so, so many people are involved in secular entertainment. It's filtered into churches. I think if you don't have something that makes your feet tap, then it's not godly. I'm not interested in your feet tapping. I'm interested in something touching our hearts. And say, so, well, preacher, your message didn't move me. I'm not interested in your intellect. I'm interested in your heart. You know, we've let so many secular stuff move in and secular humanism move in. It's, it's gagging our churches. But then also the strange vanity of social media. It's, it's, it's strangling our churches. Now listen, I know there's blessing and cursing and everything. But here's your litmus test. If you spend more time on social media than you do in prayer and studying the Word of God, it's become your idol. Well, that went over real good. Let me say it again. If you spend more time on social media than you do in prayer and Bible study, it's become your idol. And let me go ahead and help you with something on time. That's why you don't have a touch of God in your life. 
Because you only get a touch of God in your life by being on your knees talking to God and then being in the Word and Him talking to you. Uh, and the more you give yourself to the things of God, the more touch of God will be on your life. You're not going to get a touch of God on your life uh, uh, seeing where somebody had dinner tonight in social media. Uh, you're not going to do it. Now, I, I know that's not popular. I don't really care. It's right. That's why we don't have revival. That's why some of you have gotten over it. That's why some of you didn't even get in on it when it was happening. God was a moving, God was blessing, and there were some of you still to this day wasn't broken in an altar. But I promise you, before you got to the car, you had out that little phone and you said, You can't find Ezra in the Bible, but you can do this. You're welcome. I don't care if you like it or not, it's true. And when you stand before God one day, you're going to say, I wish I'd have just paid more attention to the preacher. Just like in Jeremiah's day, when he preached truth to them, and they ignored him. Hmm. The absolute fact of the matter is, some of you know more about everybody's personal life in here on social media than you know about the Scriptures. Hmm. Shame, shame, shame. Why are we idolatrous? Why is it such a hard habit to break? That's how you know you're addicted. Here's how you, I can prove you're, you're addicted. Lay your phone down for the next three weeks. Don't open up Facebook, Twitter, emails, unless it's business related. Just, just don't do any of it for three weeks. You won't make it three hours. Because you're addicted. But yet in 1 Corinthians 16, I believe it says that we ought to be addicted to the ministry. Those things we're addicted to. We ought to be addicted to the ministry. Huh? Some of you can't go a day without Facebook, but you can go Wednesday night without church every now and then. You can miss on Sunday nights, doesn't bother you. Miss Sunday school doesn't bother you. Thank you, Phil. Hmm. You can't miss Facebook. Why are we so idolatrous? Because our hearts aren't right with God. That's why we're idle. That's why we're idolatrous. The third why before you pass out. God asks, why are we ill? Look at verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Is God on the throne? Is the blood of Christ still f sufficient? Then why are we not revived? Why are we ill? Hmm? Why are there schisms in the body? Why are we not on fire? Tearing the world upside down. Too many of God's people are ill. Some are bitter. You're bitter against a brother or sister. You're bitter against family members. You're bitter on the job. You're bitter in just in life in general. It's all bumper sticker today. It said, All humans get on my nerves. I thought, there are days. Huh? But see, there's some of you, you're just bitter. Deep down inside, that bitter is festering. The bitterness is festering. It took root a long time ago. And you can't enjoy anything in life. You come to church, you're miserable. You go to your job, you're miserable. You go home, you're miserable. You're just miserable. You got a heart problem. You're ill. Miserable people are generally bitter people. Can I say this? Too many God's people are battered. Hey, I get it. 
the winds of adversity come and they blow and they hurt and there are obstacles and there are things that come against us in life. But Brother James sang the song, when are you going to rise up out of the ashes and say, blessed be the name of the Lord? You know why, when you get ill from being battered? When you get to the point you think you, you deserve something. You know what we deserve? Hell. But I'm not going to hell. And I realize this is as close to hell as I'm ever going to get. Uh, and yes, we face waves of adversity. And yes, we face uh, 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 problems and we face uh, struggles. Uh, but it's okay because I'm still saved and going to glory. Too many of God's people are ill. They're battered. They're bitter. And some are just bothered. Just bothered by everything. I'll never forget when we went to build this building, Brother Don, you weren't here then, you weren't saved then. You are still in the sinning business, as Phil calls it. When we went to build this building, there was actually people that didn't want to grow. They didn't want us to build. They didn't want to grow. They said, no, we want to stay over in a little building. We don't want to get any bigger. You know what they were saying? They were saying, we don't want Donald to get saved. Yep. That's what they were saying. Sure they were. Hmm? There's some people just bothered that God has the audacity to ask them to get out of their comfort zone. Amen. See, the philosophy of Satan is my right to my claim to myself. Well, that's filtered into churches. We think we deserve something. We think we're okay. And it doesn't matter if anybody else is going to heaven as long as I'm okay. And people have that mentality. I hope not, but they do. They don't care about going out and knocking on doors. They don't care about getting the gospel out. They don't care about revival meetings. How many revival meetings have we had when folks don't come, don't come, then they show up on Sunday and want to know what in the world happened? Yeah, amen. The Lord showed up. Where was you? They're just bothered by anything that challenges them to be better than what they are. And you may be that way tonight. Preacher, I don't want a message like this. I want to be I want to hear about going to heaven. Well, I'm going to heaven. I hope you are. But how we live matters. You see, we've been lulled to sleep by them songs about a mansion on the hilltop and all that kind of, but you understand long before we ever see one golden brick in the streets of glory, you realize there's a thing called the judgment seat of Christ. And then you do realize there's a thing called the millennial reign of Christ, and you do realize we'll reign with Him, and you'll be blessed to reign with Him in accordance to how faithful you are in this life. You know why I preach this way? Because I want you to reign in a supreme position. I don't want you to be over the dog catchers in the millennium because you were too busy being a busybody in this life. How we live matters. It matters to the lost around us because, my dear friends, if we don't shine before them and witness to them, their blood will be required at our hands. But it also matters in how we'll serve in the life to come. The Lord says, why are my people idle? Why are they idolatrous? Why are they ill? And so I ask you tonight, why? Why are you that way? Why are you not on fire? Why are you not totally in love with Jesus? Why are you not excited about telling some sinner that Jesus will save them? Why are you not excited about he's coming, he's coming, he's coming? Why are you not excited? Well, you ought to be. i tell you why you're not. You see, we are citizens of the glory world, but we live in this world. And we're inundated constantly. I mean, Satan has pulled out all the stops. And we are inundated constantly with nothing but negativity. That's all we're faced with. I mean, even the weatherman's going to lie to you tonight. Everything's negative, 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 negative. And there's an old adage, you are what you eat. And the more you're around that, and the more you're around that, the more you're around the more it starts settling. Amen. And if you're not careful, you're going to get negative. 
And even when it comes to the things of God, you get the mindset of what's the use. Some of you have prayed and prayed and prayed, and you hadn't seen it happen. You're thinking, God, don't hear my prayers. Yeah, he hears your prayers. He's just long-suffering. You've got to learn to wait on the Lord. Oh, but God really don't care. Oh, yeah, he cares. He loves you, friend, more than you know what love is. And he said, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Well, God's left me. No, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's not left you. But you've let all this negative influence come in and cause you to doubt the things of God. It's caused your luster to, to fade away, and you just are numb. Why? You know one of the most positive things to know? His name is Jesus. And if you'll just learn to walk with him and talk with him and think on him and sing to him and, and put your affections and your thoughts on things above all the negative pulls of this world won't, it won't bring you down I'm telling you great thing happened during revivals this, this year I still I don't watch Fox News anymore I don't watch any news anymore I haven't seen any sports anymore it's a good thing because I forgot how much negativity was in all that and I just get to enjoy the Lord uh, I came in, I was telling Phil, I came in I, on the way to, uh, to my office this morning. I, I had a thought, and I got here, and I got to looking at it, and outlined a whole message, and I'm sitting there looking at it after, and I thought, nah, that wasn't it. I kept reading, and God, I ended up in Jeremiah 8, and God said, here it is tonight, and I bet you're all glad this is where we're at tonight, aren't we? But he says, why? Why are you not revived? Why are you not hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Why are you not still excited that Eddie got born again on Sunday? Because you've allowed things to bring you down to this world's level. Don't let it affect you anymore. Some of you, you're ill. You need to get rid of that. Because we got a great physician. And he does have a balm of Gilead. And he can extract that root of bitterness. But you've got to bring it to him. He's not going to force himself on you. But tonight he asks you, why are you that way? Has he not been so good to you that you don't need to be in that state? He has been. Just look at your life. Start counting your blessings. Just look at all God's done for you. He's been good to you. He said, but you don't understand what I've been through. No, but I know where you could have been. Mm -mm. and you are reaping better than you've sown God's been good to you so one of the worst things that can happen is God looking at you tonight saying why when God should be looking at you and saying hallelujah they got it look at them look at them when everything's coming against them they're still overcoming it look at them look at them they got it oh they can't get enough Oh, yes, I'll answer your prayers. But instead, how many times has he looked at us and said, why? Why? How many of you parents have looked at your kids saying, why? I taught you better than that. Why? Well, that's what God does. In this chapter, he's saying, why? 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 Is he saying that to you tonight? Don't leave out of here the same way you come in. Why don't you come get it straightened out and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't know why myself. Sometimes myself gets in the way. Why don't you crucify that flesh tonight and leave out of here victorious. Leave out of here excited about the things of God. Leave out of here stirred about the things of God. You'll do that. There's no telling what God's going to do around the corner. It all starts with us looking to God and answering those questions of why to God. Some have already come. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While he picks out a song, Miss Renee comes to play. Folks are praying. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for certainly, Lord, winking at our ignorance. But God, thank you for also dealing with us as sons. Now, Father, so many 
times we're guilty of taking our eyes off of you and the things of God and looking around and Lord we're subject to end up self-centered God help us tonight to just do business with you help us Lord to turn from the errors of our ways help us to get excited about the things of God to be stirred to shine as lights in this dark world we live in Help us, Lord, to impact some lost soul even tomorrow. God, to open doors for us to be able to tell someone about the greatness of Jesus and the good grace of God. God, I know it was not even close to being a salvation message, but Lord, if there's somebody here tonight lost and you've been dealing with them about their sin, I pray they'd come tonight and take a Bible and show them how to be saved. God, if there's somebody here tonight saved, but Lord, they've lost the joy of your salvation, I pray tonight they'd come and Lord, they'd once again be restored to that joy unspeakable and full of glory. Thank you for these that have come. You know their need. And God, just have your will and way now in this invitation. Speak to hearts and we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.